the digital art era is here. AI and art creation tools empower anyone to make it. Blockchain technologies allow anyone to own it. VR, AR, and extended reality immerse us in it. Let's talk to artists and innovators behind the visual magic. I'm your host, Roger Dickerman. Welcome to the future of art. Today, we welcome Ayla El Musa. Ayla is an artist known as the Queen of Waves. She harnesses the power of those waves, sacred geometry, and self-portraiture to create dreamlike environments that have captivated the digital art space. She's released at Christie's. She's collaborated with Playboy, 6529, and Noble Gallery. In this interview, you're going to get a sense for just how thoughtful she is about her craft and how she shares it. Let's get to it. Ayla El Musa, welcome to the future of art. Thank you so much, Roger. I'm like very excited to be here and be chatting with you today. After what we determined was a two year gap since we once had a wonderful lunch with shout out to Rio, another fabulous artist and musician. Yeah, that was an that was during NFT LA, I believe, like 2021. And I didn't know who you were. So big shout out to Rio. He knows everybody, Rio. Um, but that was an amazing conversation we had in the, I don't remember which hotel it was, but it was in a wonderful hotel, downtown LA. Agreed. I don't think I've been back to LA since I'm going to have to change that at some point in time. Mm -hmm. And what's fun about us recording this episode is it happens on a very, very special morning, only a few hours removed from him of Aphrodite finding a new home. That's your one of one. Want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I am. As we call it, I have Zoomies, which I always get after a sale. Um, yeah, I woke up today and had a, an incredible offer from an amazing collector, Art Pleb, who is a, I would say, a staple in the in the community and the space, and has a very incredible art collection that I am excited to be part of. And so, yeah, today is the day that she. She went to his home and um, yeah, it's, uh, and then I get to be on this incredible podcast and talk to you about all things art and just celebrate and be excited. And yeah, that was my only, that was my only one of one. So now I'm, I'm starting to work on the next, the next one. Incredible. Well, listen, I'm excited to dig into your art and process and of course the future, had to mm -hmm. give you your flowers first because it's literally just hours removed from that. And I think that's amazing. Uh, yeah. a, good, a good sign for this episode. So I think so. A good sign for this episode. I, I, I don't want to say I harassed you, but I started to see you posting this podcast and I got really excited. I'm like, please goals is to be on here. And you're like, yeah, let's do it. And I think that was just a wonderful way to kick off August. Let's go. Let's kick it off and let's, let's kick go. off August with this question. Ayla, how do you define art? You know, that is such a good question that I've been ruminating on. And I believe it's not, it's, it's such a multifaceted question and a multifaceted answer. And I believe in general, it is kind of the, the visual language in which humans, you know, share our collective experience on this planet. And I believe it is, you know, it, it is a way in which we interpret our stories and our myths and our dreams, our desires, our fears, and, and represent it in this visual way that everyone can understand. And to me, it's so exciting because it, yeah, it really connects us all. Like I'm connected to the, the humans who were creating art, you know, in the caves of France, and I'm connected to my current, you know, present artists. And I believe I'm connected to the artists of the future because as we continually share our visuals and our art pieces, we bake it into to the art history of this entire planet. And so, yeah, I think it is just this incredible force in which we share our stories. And at the end of the day, it's somehow this wonderful magic. I love it. And a huge part of your story, or a part of your story, I shouldn't say a huge part, you define it, not me. Um, mm. You're called the queen of waves. 
<laughs> and I'd love for you, there's a couple components of your artwork that I'd love to dig deeper in, but I feel like that's a good place to start. Let's start with the Queen of Waves. If you could describe that in your own words. Yeah. So I'll give a shout out, obviously, to Brendan North, who is an incredible photographer. And he titled me the Queen of Waves early on. And I somewhat enjoyed that title and just incorporated it and, and went with it. And waves is something, the ocean and waves is something I've always been drawn to as a kid. It's sort of how I grew up. You know, I grew up literally learning the alphabet on the sands, you know, on the ocean sands in Kuwait, which is where my parents are from. And, you know, moving around, I then, you know, settled and had was living on an island to go anywhere, I would have to cross the ocean on a ferry boat. And so just this idea of water has always been present around me physically. But then in general, it's, to me, it's life. You know, the ocean is life and it is violent. It is beautiful. It is unknown, which is, I think, so much to do with humans and how we think and, and our minds. And then as I got older and started to kind of dive into psychology and how we, you know, represent that in art and in our, you know, in our language and how we talk about it, ocean is one of those founding symbols of the human mind and so it's yeah it's just something I am in love with I'm scared of and always my my whole I would say my whole story and my visuals as you see will always have a wave even if it's abstracted somehow there's some type of wave form if you will now let's move to geometry so I think mm. that's another interesting piece where when I'm viewing your artworks, it's it's fun to hear you describe waves because I think you describe them as 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 violent. They can be chaotic. They can be beautiful. There's a lot going on in, in waves. <laughs> Yet you are so artful at confining them, at giving them borders and giving them boundaries and giving them shapes. Uh, yeah. So talk a little bit about ge uh, geometry. Yeah, that's interesting. So geometry... There's this idea of sacred geometry, which, you know, comes a lot in, in the idea of alchemy, which at the end of the day, I think it's the search for the proverbial, um, uh, like holy grail and, and gold. And, and I think this idea of geometry is so, it's, it's math, right? And I think that's what makes up our entire universe. And um to give to give this body of water so to speak confines and form i think is an interesting way for me to not control it but just to kind of question all of these big ideas of of math and and symbols and um i went to a waldorf school so the education system that my parents me through was Waldorf and that was one of the things that we learned very early on was drawing these you know these sacred shapes and these geometric shapes and what I'm very interested in right now and maybe what you are kind of when you look at my page currently is I'm taking the symbol for water in alchemy which is an inverted triangle which actually is also a symbol for uh, the divine feminine. So there's this beautiful play that I'm that I'm intrigued by with this idea of water and femininity and how it kind of is all life. You know, water gives us life, and as do women, they bring life onto this planet. And so I think there's this very interesting um, research that I'm trying to discover, if you will, with geometry and, and um, symbols. How about reflection? Reflection, mm -hmm. mirrors? Yeah, I mean, if you go to that wonderful myth of Narcissus who got enamored by his reflection, I think, and consumed by it, I think humans in general have always been fascinated with how we look, right? Because that is something that 
that we show the world. Our face is what is the first thing we see usually. Um, and so for me, there's, there's this wonderful introspection when you look at yourself and I, and I, it's interesting because I'm always taking my image, right? So these are all self portraits that I take, but they're also not in a way because you never really see my face. And so I could be anybody I could, you know, I'm trying to represent this entire idea of, of human, but reflection is interesting because there is one piece that I created where you do see my reflection slightly in the mirror. And I think that's very interesting because yeah, you, we are who we are as we go through this, this world, right? So learning who I am, learning how my mind is and, and what I look like, I think is something very interesting to, um, to play with. Those are several components of your work. Now, how about the tools that you use to bring them into creation? You talked about capturing your own image. Obviously, photography mm. plays a role there. But what else from the tool side? Yeah, so camera, obviously, vital, <laughs> vital tool. And then I use uh, Procreate, which is a recent, or maybe not so recent anymore, but a recent discovery, which I, you know, I paint on a lot of my images now. Um, to give it this dynamic painterly feel. And then I use Final Cut, After Effects, and Photoshop to compile all of these images. And then obviously a DJI drone to capture the waves. And then I, I kind of liken it to almost collage in a way, but, but in my own sort of haphazard way as I'm just putting these images all together. And if you look at my work, usually sort of there's layers. So it's like a, a level one, which is sort of nature somehow, and then my body, and then the surreal waves. And I really enjoy working in a very simplistic way, because it allows me to kind of explore the themes and really share the themes that I'm trying to share. <laughs> Well, let's go from the tools to how you choose to distribute your artwork. What I find so fascinating, let, let's let's go back to 2021 when we first met with Rio, right? Yeah. We're having those conversations. Everything is brand new. Your minted artwork at that time was less than one year old. And that's amazing yeah. to look back on now, almost three years old. So mm -hmm. it's starting to broaden out. We're starting to experience the passage of time. And, and what comes along with the passage of time is more, more minted artwork and more mm -hmm. collections and more collaborations. And you've done quite a lot in these three years. So I would ask you, what, what do you go through when you are sort of birthing an artwork and then deciding what to do with it and where it's going to go, maybe even whether to mint it or not, but then mm -hmm. where, where it ultimately goes? That's such a good question. Yeah, it's crazy. It's been three years. You broke, you broke my brain when you said it's been two since... Uh, since I we believe, got together. I know, I really believe time, time, there's no time when you live in the metaverse, really. <laughs> just, I remember those days when everyone would always be like, you know, don't forget to eat and drink water because life escapes. Um, it's interesting. When I started, I was very clear that my moving work was going to be my grails. So the moving artwork was always just the one of one and then I felt like I was very lucky because as, as I progressed and started, you know, sharing and minting more work, I was able to also then share still work and, and have that be part of, part of the world of Ayla. And then I got to kind of explore different fun things like doing a nude pixel collection, which was really actually really a joke. It was a joke that went well, if you will. Um, and the whole idea behind it was obviously inspired by punks because punks are these wonderful crypto, crypto native symbols actually. And so I thought it would be really hilarious to take um, my nude image and make it super pixelated. So the closer you look, the less you see. And then as, you know, I think it was like year two coming along and we're in year three, I was trying to figure out how do I 
continue that story. And it was something that I had been literally ruminating on for two years. Like, how do I evolve nude pixels? And then nude abstracts came along. And so it's interesting because how I choose to share and if I mint work, it's kind of, if we liken it to Alpha Centauri Kid, it's kind of the call of the muse, really. Like if it, when you feel it in your bones and you're like, this is, this is right, this is meant for the world to share, it kind of just happens. Um, but I feel very, yeah, I feel very lucky that, that I have almost built these different worlds within my wavy world, if you will. And I think that's really exciting. I think that's fascinating that to go back to where you started with that, the one mm -hmm. of one philosophy of that's where your animation goes. That's where you bring mo movement. Yeah. And then, so talk a little bit more about your still artwork and is that uh, you've done some additions. You've also done some amazing collaborations. Oh, yeah. is, is that where the still artwork finds its home? Yeah, usually. I mean, there was one, there's one, one edition that I did that is moving. Um, and that was for the 6529 meme cards. And um, that was just a, a piece that then again felt really right. But normally my my collaborations are um are editions and still unless it's a one of one. So I was lucky to do the collaboration with Christie's for for Art Basel. And that of course was a was a moving one of one piece. And then Noble Cards as well, wonderful artifaction, who's another incredible collector. Um, that was a still piece. I'm trying to think if there's another collaboration that I am forgetting, but I don't believe so. And then, well, yeah, it's, tell me. I was going to say not, not additions, but you did the Playboy collaboration. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, that was okay. So the Playboy collaboration, that's funny. So speaking about time, when I, I think it was like 2017 or 18, I was much more active on Instagram than I am now, but I posted in my story, something along the lines of like, I will shoot for Playboy. And I've always been fascinated by Playboy, like just ever since I discovered my dad's Playboys at like 13 or something, <laughs> I just love that entire, you know, arc of, of what they represented, I would say back in the day. And um, that was for Bitcoin Miami. And they were, it was really cool how it came about because I believe Slime Sunday was doing like a curated, a curated post with Playboy and he, they picked sort of the top seven artists to, to look out for. And, and they very kindly put me first. And then Liz and the team reached out to me and asked if I wanted to do a collaboration with them. And that was, that was how I got onto Super Air actually, because it was at Bitcoin Miami. And then it, I don't think it was, it was like minted on uh, Bitcoin some rickety Bitcoin chain that wasn't working. And then they moved the entire collection to, to super air. And I just was so excited because that, that piece that I did was very inspired by one of their old summer August of like 68 covers. So it was very like a dream come true that I had manifested in 2018. <laughs> Yeah, your first artwork on Super Rare and collected by one of the OG collectors in the space, Patty Stash. Yeah, I believe it's I believe it's up listed on secondary, but he was great. Yeah, he was sort of the one that took the leap, the chance on me. And then it was what started, so to speak, the tidal wave. <laughs> Nicely um, done. Nicely done. Yeah, there's some good. It's very easy to make good puns with it. <laughs> But that really started, kickstarted, you know, the, 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 the notification and sort of people seeing my artwork and then 6529 and NSD Dima all were my very early collectors. So it's been a wild ride. Let's talk about the wild ride, the tidal wave. Um, mm. since, since that moment and, and really that collaboration kicking things off and then some of the 
the the legendary personalities in the space that you mentioned, six five two nine and SD Dima, a lot of love for him. Um, yeah. They come they come into the picture, and 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 now a lot of time has passed, and you've gone on again. You know, I I, I don't say prolific in that you're over minting. I say you've you've done a lot, and I always from the outside looking in, I have a perception that you have a really firm grip on yourself and mm -hmm. your approach. I view it as you're controlling the wave. <laughs> yeah, in, in, trying. In, in a way, in a way. So how is it retaining? I mean, one, do you feel that that's accurate? And two, how is it controlling that wave in such a crazy space? Yeah, that's such a beautiful analogy. So th like, thank you for noticing that. Um, I guess my whole approach to, the, to my practice is to be timeless and not trendy. I think that's something I've always really wanted because I do, I do want to build a wave slowly that kind of can continue. And I think in a space so wild and so crazy, I remember in early 2021, when I started to get a lot of sales, I had several collectors telling me, like, kick up your prices, like get up those double digits, like go now. And I didn't feel ready. I was like, I, I'm not ready for that yet. Like I, not that I didn't deserve it, but I just didn't feel like that was the trajectory that, that I was going to be on. I mean, I know several artists are incredible and OGs in the space and um, they, they took that approach and it's definitely worked. But for me, I'm all about a very slow and steady build. And I want those, I kind of want to be almost discovered quietly like I really enjoy you know just, yeah snail and snail pace and allowing me to also really get into what I'm what I'm doing and discovering and then I can take time and it's not to say that there's no stress because there's when that hype comes there's definitely like oh my gosh am I minting too slow you know is is anyone noticing me but I think for me that's just something very important is to to do it timelessly and slowly and then build up that provenance so now I feel like very very honored with art club because again I feel all the collectors that I have are, are serious collectors who kind of know the vision and and see where everything is going so I enjoy that I would say and I love that you're being rewarded for that philosophy. I mean, a lot, a lot of different roads for different people, many valid mm -hmm. paths, but I like that totally. you're being rewarded for that approach, that slower approach, being very thoughtful. And then people like Art Pleb are, I mean, you're obviously aware of him, he's aware of you, but in a mm -hmm. sense, today happens in the depths yeah. of a market that's not so great, but somebody's seeing what you're doing mm -hmm. and they value it and bam, thing, things happen for you. Yeah, I, I think that's that's my philosophy and that's very beautiful. And I really love that you that you can tell that you can look at that when you research. And I think that's very much what I like. I love someone who does the research and can look and it's not it's not hype, it's really just quality and timelessness. So yay. <laughs> How do you think about the artist collector relationship? Uh, actually last episode with Michael Kutcha, uh, mm -hmm. we were, we were going into that a little bit further and some of the, of course there are always pitfalls with that. There are also yeah. opportunities with that and, and collectors do naturally, at least at this present moment, have the option and the ability to play a much larger role, a much more transparent role in an artist's success or the mm -hmm. opposite, but let's go with the positive side here. How do you feel about that that interplay? And, and have you seen certain collectors try to lift you up and, and take you to a next level? Yeah, I mean, I feel like in terms of art history, this is this is a moment where collectors and artists have an incredible ability to, to talk and build a relationship. I know sort of in the Renaissance, there was that, you know, idea of patronage and, and supporting artists. But then I think as we grow into the modern age, there's this idea of gatekeeping where it's, where there's this barrier between artists and collectors. And I think now, now it's gone back to this wonderful, essential friendship. And there's definitely, there's, I mean, everyone who has bought my artwork, I feel champions me 
and and builds me up and and has become friends there's so there, I'm trying to think if there's any collector that I don't really speak to there's a few anon ones that have bought that have bought my pieces but I feel like there are definitely some core collectors who I can ask advice and not even they haven't even some of them haven't even collected my work there's just some incredible minds in the space that I can speak to and ask for advice and I think I mean, with everything, you know, there's that wonderful quote, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. I believe it was Uncle Ben who said it to Peter Parker. <laughs> That's right. I, but, I, I like that you know the reference. Yeah, but I, you know, there's, there is something with that. So, you know, collectors, the collectors of this space are also, also starting trends, right? You know, you can, you can have full control over an artist. And I think, mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if many of them know that they have that power. I know I, you know, I know, for example, Praveen, who's an incredible confidant of mine and friend and, you know, works with Deca, And he, he discovered my work through 6529. And that was a wonderful connection because, you know, we're really good friends and I, I ask him a lot of advice. And so there's, yeah, there's definitely this wonderful building, but also, yeah there is a great power with, with that. It's really multi-directional. And I, mm -hmm. and I feel both, I mean, both sides are completely valid. The artist has a lot of power over the collector base and the collector base has a lot of power over the artist. It's this really interesting symbiosis. And to me, one of the more fascinating aspects is, is it's happening. A lot of people talk about the 24 seven, 365 public ledger, right? We're, we're all on blockchain here. You can see yeah. people's offers. You can see, you can see the whole everything. thing. Everything yeah. is out there. However, I mean, I guess this is talked about as well, but the social aspect is so fascinating. We're really, the social aspect has been in large part centralized to Twitter and Discord. And yes, totally. th yes, there are private Telegram chats and groups and things that break off outside of those two sort of monoliths, but they <laughs> have existed and this space would not be what it is without those two social platforms these past several years. Absolutely. I mean, I, I talk about that with my brother. I'm like, what would we do if we didn't have X? Twitter <laughs> but you know like there is it's so it's so vital right now and it's um pretty incredible like all the artists all my friends are all on are all in dms and I think um I mean there's definitely the social like there's definitely a a you can't beat a real life experience like that's how we met and I don't think we could have had such an incredible conversation if it hadn't been in person and that's why, you know, all these events are truly, they're really incredible, but yeah, without this online, these online, I don't use discord so much. Are you really using discord a lot? Less and less yeah. er early on. I viewed it almost equally. And in fact, I think since telegram and WhatsApp and, and some of those types of platforms yeah. have sort of split off the quote unquote alpha groups or some of those, the smaller groups that talk together. But mm -hmm. there was a point in time where it it was Twitter for the sort of public, everyone meets in the middle, understands yeah. that this is a, even though it's very small, relatively speaking, at the time, a large community around this, oh, we're all yeah. de debating artwork, even before PFPs, then P the PFP surge comes in and, and, and all that good stuff. But Discord was sort of where you went to get the good stuff, the, the good info, the good info, the alpha chats, that was yeah. really the home. But I ha I do have to say I, it, it's falling off. Um, I, I don't personally spend as much time there anymore. And I know a lot of people that, that feel the same. I mean, it's interesting because I feel like height of discord and, and, and even clubhouse and all of those, it was, it was during that collective pandemic that we were all experiencing. And so we were all at home able to communicate. And I think now it's probably less and less because you know, we're out more in terms of like meeting and, and chatting and getting, getting together. But what's interesting about what about Twitter or X, I have to keep saying now in this bear market is I feel actually the community has distilled to those who really are here for the long run. And I think that's, what's so exciting is because it's almost easier to communicate with, with, 
different people and different collectors and bigger artists who are still here because they see your comments or they read your DMs because it's actually, we've pared down a little bit from a lot of the hype and the noise. So it's an, it's an interesting one. The art side goes through so many of those cycles. You know, oh, I'm, I'm, we, we've we've been around a while. There are those who have been around longer, but you know, speaking personally, I think 2020 to 2021 held within it almost two or three mini cycles in and of itself. Mm. And then we hit this raging, you know, everyone tidal like, wave influencer central <laughs> tidal wave. And then now things have leveled out. It actually feels a lot like the early summer of 2021, where things took about a two and a half month break. And, yeah. it, and it distilled down to only those who really cared to be there. And we're in that moment now. Yeah, definitely. And it's also interesting. I always find summers are in general, just a slower time, just because everyone's on holiday and, and going. So yeah, it's, it's actually quite, it's quite nice. I quite like it. And I think there's going to be, I always sort of joke with my friends. I think you know, those who are here are, are really here for it in general. And then you're going to see a lot of people come back from quote unquote social media breaks when the hype starts again <laughs> to, to, to re-engage. But um, yeah, it's really exciting. Now, how do you handle the totally wild, but let's, let's go into a, a viral social phase, right? Ooh. How do you handle that type of a phase? Because again, you're someone that I view with a lot of respect because you have mm -hmm. such control over what you're perceived control. And I know certain moments I'm sure on the other side feel completely chaotic, but <laughs> right. But from the outside looking in again, yeah. you have, you have such an, an artful steering wheel about you. Mm. Um, and you're also, you, your, your subject matter, you, you share sensual artwork at times. And I've always wondered about that, about this Again, the crazy side of the space, the viral side of the space, when when maybe not everyone is in it for the art and things get, you know, things get chaotic from that end. Um, how do you feel about that? I mean, it's definitely natural in terms of just human human chaos and, and hype. But I think, yeah, I mean, there's always, there's totally always, you know, that panic or that that terror as an artist, when you, when you're doing something, you're, oh my God, no one sees my work. No one likes my work. And then you're, you're looking at all of these I think That's one thing that's really interesting about the psychology, like you were talking about too, is we're constantly seeing sales, even in slow times. And then again, with this incredible, with hype and viral moments that, that can cause panic. But I think really, truly, it's been a wonderful lesson in terms of just you kind of go back to your why because freaking out isn't going to really do anything. It, there's, it's just wasted energy and sometimes it's fine. You know, you need to get it out. And, and, but I think in general, mm -hmm. taking a very calm and solid approach because this isn't going anywhere. Right. I think that's, yeah. Let's go more into that, that this isn't going anywhere. And I, I want to know where your mind is relative to the future. As you cast your eyes out now with three years of experience mm. in the highs and in the lows, many collections and collaborations, how, how do you look at the future? Frame that any way you want. I mean, I think the future is, it's interesting. So I would say the future is unknown in general. I can't know the future. And it's a little bit tumultuous but I think that's where art thrives and I also think in terms of the future of blockchain and crypto it's it's really here to stay and you're starting to see institutions and incredible respected galleries and figures talk about it and it's not going anywhere and I think that that hype cycle that kind of took over in 2021 and early 22 it's, it's come down to an equilibrium now and we can really get to work. And I think that's this period now in the next 10 years is really where the work, the work begins. And that's so exciting. And it's a fun, I, you know, it's a phenomenal time. And I think you, you know, you're doing this incredible podcast and, and sharing stories. And a lot of these artists are going to be, I would say part of the zeitgeist of art history and, 
yeah, I'm, I'm definitely excited for the future and what's to come. You know, it's interesting when you talk about the podcast, because this is a newer podcast, you know, this, it's yeah. a podcast that's 10 episodes in and it's precursor, you know, NFT origin stories. Yeah. I did really almost 70 artist interviews and a lot of live streams with Parrot and we had a great time. And the reason for the shift is, I would say it's tied to what you just said. You said, it's time to get to work. You said, or you said, mm -hmm. we can, we can get to work now. And I think yeah. that's such an important perspective and a meaningful perspective to me because the, this show exists to push. Yes. I want, I want to evolve this show to talk to those in the zeitgeist, to push this into a, a growth stage, to be a part of what I, I also view as inevitable. I do believe this is here to stay. Sure. We may have some pivots in the meantime, we may have to all be a little agile, but I think there's yeah. no, no question that this is going to be a segment of, of art history and culture history. Totally. And I think it's, I mean, pivoting is great and being nimble and, and adapting, but I think also humans are very good at that in terms of, you know, and, and you're seeing it too. You're seeing it in terms of like certain art, right? The idea of additions or open additions and, you know, how people are, are maneuvering now in this space is, is a testament to, to the agility, I think, of, of humans being able to, to go with certain to go with the flow but also I had a point and it ran away from my brain what were we you were just saying about the future you said something and it sparked a, it sparked a, it sparked yeah, talking a, about getting to work and oh yeah get it. yeah yeah so you know like the great empires of Rome wasn't built in a day right so now it's time to lay the pavement but it's also really, I think, a great time because there's a bridge between the digital space and I don't want to call it digital art, but the art that exists in the digital realm branching over into the IRL. And I think that's an in, very fascinating to me because, yeah, that marriage, there, there's no, it's not going to be one or the other. I think it's going to be this wonderful marriage. And it also allows... You know, you're seeing artists like Grant and Jake Fried, Freed, I never know how to say it, his last name, and Alpha Centauri Kid, you know, they're, they're starting to do these incredible collaborations with very respected institutions. And I think that's, this is now where it gets exciting and, and we get to work. I'm so happy you referred to that. It was one of the questions here from my side, how do you think about your work displayed physically? Are you thinking about that at present moment, largely about screen tech? Are you thinking about going other routes with it? You know, it's interesting. So that was something when I, when I started my practice, like in, when I started working with moving, moving art in 2015, that was something that I was very quick to try and find was, a, was a screen to put my, to put to display my work. And it's something I think even in 2013, I knew my work would exist and be displayed on a screen. I just like knew it in my bones. And I was able to find a screen from LG that was one of their OLED, like paper thin screens. And now I'm, you know, it's interesting. I've done a few prints for the nude abstract series. And it's been really interesting because there's this, there's the, the dynamic moving one, the moving print, the lenticular print. And then there's this beautiful print and you can't escape the, um, there is something amazing about physicals. And now what I'm, I can't give too much away because I've been, I've been thinking about this since 2021, but um I'm really now in the discovering phase of combining tech and physicals in a really interesting way that I think is going to be what we call the magnum opus of my career. <laughs> we're, getting, we're getting into Ayla Alpha corner here. We're getting into Ayla Alpha. <laughs> yeah. So 
I, yeah, I think it's, and it, as we evolve, right, the tech will evolve too. You know, I think the screens from 2021, and now you have, I think Danvis has really been pushing the, pushing it with their screens. It's going to get all kinds of fun and crazy. I think that's one of the most fascinating parts where if you've attended various conferences and forward-leaning art and tech conferences, you clearly see people working on exceptional displays creative yeah. displays, very futuristic stuff that one day will be very incredible. But where all that stuff has to start is inaccessibly. You're not going to get much of it. It's going to be extremely high priced. You'll be able to maybe interact with it as a one-off at some place. And you'll say to yourself, that's incredible. I hope I see more of it. And then there's this lag time. And then all of a sudden that incredible hardware or, or things like it get popularized, price comes down, becomes accessible. Yeah. Um, when I think about that, I guess, inevitable tech workflow, I get really excited about your artwork because I think mm. that your art, it almost naturally lends itself to where you want to take it. I, I, I could easily see you exploring more of the, let's say, phys loosely speaking, physical photography side. I could see you exploring the motion and, you know, it existing larger than life on the most futuristic screen tech and everything in between. So again, hearing that you are exploring already the intersection between those two things is very exciting. Yeah, I have to, I have to show you because it's, it's in motion. I'll, I'll like send you a, some photos of, of what I'm working on, but it's, you know, it's interesting because there's this, there's this um, incredible gallery verse in, in London. And I, I think they have this Zach Lieberman show right now. I, I think it ends on Sunday, but it's incredible. Like the way the screens and the tech give life to the work in this totally different way I think is it's so exciting and yeah it's it's um it's a big moment in history I think we're really gonna you know with with AI and with tech and with everyone sort of focused on you know this space like it's not it's it's serious now it's not going away like we've like we've spoken about so I think the innovation that we're gonna see is is great and then you know in in Miami Basel I want to say the monolith screen like when you see your work big like that it's it's just seriously it's like a tidal wave it's so it there is something about presence and size and just which you can't really get with a printed paper or a canvas so yeah I, I'm very excited to think about the future that awaits us. I mean, we see it on certain billboards or again in those unique examples, but to think mm -hmm. about the future that awaits us in anything from airports to hotel lobbies to, yeah. to all sorts of things, it's going to get wild. And I want to give a shout out to someone that just keeps breaking my own brain. He's not the most viral artist on social media. He's not the loudest, but he's undoubtedly one of the most talented, Jesse Woolston. Jesse Woolston keeps popping up in these large scale displays globally. And I would highly suggest anyone check out his account and some of these images or videos that are captured of these displays, but that's what awaits us. Yeah. I mean, Jesse is really, he's, he's on the pulse of something that is truly it kind of goes back to your, I, your first question and you know what is art and it surrounds us all but Jesse is really going into these like fundamental questions of what it means to be human and what it means to like experience nature and the way he's doing it is really profound so yeah I, I have a lot of respect for that man <laughs> on, on the bleeding edge of display on the bleeding edge bleeding being the operative word <laughs> <laughs> So Ayla, I, I always like to pose two questions that oppose each other. And the first question would be, what's something for the listeners that you yourself just expect to happen in the future of art? You could go into the Web3 future of art, you can go to the broader future of art, doesn't matter. Just one thing that you expect that you would want to just say to people. And then the other side of the coin is, what's something that you wouldn't necessarily necessarily say you expect, or maybe even it's not likely, but you yourself hope for? Oh, that is such an amazing question. Um, I mean, I definitely 
I'm almost going to answer them backwards. So I sure. definitely, I, I, I really hope for, oh, I think the, um, I really hope for the idea of gatekeeping because it does happen. I really hope for it to, to dissipate in a way where there is more access to the artists who are building within this digital world to access, I think, more institutions. Like I really hope for that marriage and for people to do their research in, in the artistry because there's so many incredible artists. And then, I mean, I think it will definitely, we spoke about this already. I think it's, it's inevitable that there will be a marriage of, you know, digital retrospectives and and you're going to start to see I mean what would be great would be for I mean it's almost very wishful hopeful thinking but would be like a Louvre to acquire a piece and they only really work with you know archives and and art history and old old pieces but I think that would be just something to hope for or like the Met to do you know they have a they have a yearly Met ball theme that sort of funds um funds their costume their costume space and i think to have it really build into something like that where they do a a metaverse theme i think that's a great hope but i think it's inevitable to your second question we will see we will see more collaborations and and i think those with vision incorporating digital i don't know if that answered the question but long ramble rant <laughs> all we need is time right for all of those things to pass and some of those institutions it just takes longer and i think in this in the wild web 3 west we're used to thinking that a year is a long time and in reality and when it comes to institutions when it comes to traditional art collection a lot of times there's no sense in thinking about anything but decades, which is interesting. That's brain breaking in and of itself. I mean, that's, I mean, that's brain breaking. And to be able to like be a living artist and make sales like today in, in a moment in time where, where art, I mean, art is so profound and art really is, you know, again, to your first question, it is what makes us human and what connects us all, but it's still a luxury to buy an artwork. So I think to be a living artist in this time and to have a sale and see a sale is mind bending because you're, you know, we're already ahead of 99% of the artists that came before us. So yeah. It, it's interesting to look at the digital art medium. I look, uh, let's use an analogy that's very fitting mm -hmm. for today. I want to, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll lay this on you and then you, you tell me what you think. I would almost term it like a pent up wave or a pent up ocean where for decades, digital artists had nowhere to go with their work when it came to finding a collector home. And so it found homes everywhere else. It found homes for free in trade for social capital on social media. It mm -hmm. found homes in contracts and in commercial work and on movie screens and basically gated behind commercial success that Rarely, if ever, it actually trickles back to the artist itself in terms of acclaim and in terms of upside. Mm -hmm. And then now all of a sudden with the invention of an agreed upon, even by a small group, an agreed upon outlet yes. for the NFT and the tokenization of a placeholder for that artwork, which again, mm -hmm. enough people have sort of circulated around that a market has developed, which unlocks the tidal wave where mm -hmm. uh talked about this a little bit last episode as well with Michael. Uh, but the the financialization is a really important part, whether we like to admit it or not, for a lot of things to come after it. And it's, it's, it's necessary for a lot of the things to come after it. Yeah. I mean, it's so necessary and it's so, and I feel like a lot of my peers in this space, we've all experienced that, you know, like where do you post your, your artwork, not your commercial work, but your artwork, you know, you can do it on Instagram, you could do it on Tumblr. And then, yeah, you could do it for movies and, and visual effects, but it's, 
Yeah. And it's giving a lot of autonomy back to the artists. Like, I think that is such a, like, that's such a huge moment for artists to be able to kind of relax and take care of themselves and just purely create. I think, yeah, it's, it's the story that we're going to continually refer back to in 2022 onwards. I think that's such an incredible benchmark because yeah, that's, there's this incredible, and everything we've talked about, this is incredible interaction with the world, with art, with collectors, and then obviously finances, like that's pretty huge for artists to have that. I'll tell you something that surprised me recently. Yeah. And, and what I expect, so, so the thing that I'm looking most forward to is artists that are digitally native, mm. stepping more and more and more into their voices. And yeah. understanding that this is this was inevitable all along. And mm -hmm. what surprises me is, uh, what doesn't surprise me is an artist who makes their first sale, period, in their career, that yeah. that 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 initial first sale is is oh wow, like it has a, a huge wow factor. It could be shocking. It can bring in a flood of emotion. I I completely completely get that. But what's been a bit surprising to me is, uh, and probably because I don't come from art right? This is, this is a later education for me. And I love it. I love every bit of it. And certain things seem obvious to me when they're definitely anything but obvious in industry. And so what surprises me is talking to artists with decades long careers, obviously mm -hmm. operating at an incredibly high level, playing in in integral roles in movies and animation, you, you name it, yeah. making their first sale and having that same emotion. Yeah. To me, I view I view that person. I view I view you. I view so any any artist that's really meeting in in the middle here and doing the thing. Um, you know, it's obvious to me, but it's but it's not obvious yet in the moment. How do you feel about that? Oh my god, it's it's it for me. I don't think it ever goes away. That that shock and that moment and that excitement, like. And I think just to, to have that be recognized as well, I think is huge. That's, you know, I find that's always something that's such a fundamental principle of human psychology is to be recognized and to be seen. And I think having that, you know, stamp of, you know, someone looking at you and going, actually, I, I, I value what you're saying and it doesn't matter the medium of where you're saying it but I respect it. And I think that's also what's so cool too about a lot of these digital collectors is they, you know, it's a whole new era of collect of collectors. And I think what's interesting that you say is, is you don't have an art history background or, or it's new for you, but I think everyone knows art because it's, there's no right or wrong. It's instinctual, right? You, you see something and you connect with it. And so I always kind of tell people who are like, oh, well, they don't know art history or do they know art history? I'm like, you can't really, you can understand it. And art history is incredible. I love art history, but it's a whole new era and a whole new set of um, perspective that comes with that. Really, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I had, yeah. you know, an incredible art, I would call it appreciation. I drew, mm -hmm. I loved it. I and to your point, you appreciate the aesthetics around you and you form your own opinions without even realizing it. Yeah. But, but I wouldn't change a thing not being sort of steeped in formalized art history yeah. for several decades of my life. And then now being able to come back around to it, I like the fresh eyes aspect of it. I like that someone will say something, maybe they'll disparage digital art and I'll look at them like they have two heads. I'm like, you're you're insane. Like This is going to be yeah. an ir irrelevant conversation in a couple of decades. I mean, it's almost already irrelevant because you can see, like, it's so funny to see certain people go, oh my God, like, for example, I know there was like a huge punk sale recently. I think even today or yesterday, it was like a big one. And people are just like, what the, like what? But I think that's how change happens too, right? Like you were saying, it's in, in the grand scheme of, of the, the world where it's such a small community, but where I think a loud one and that's where where things start to change and then you know I mean humans are fa like humans fascinate me this idea of collecting in general 
but that's something we've always done. And so, yeah, it's really going to be an irrelevant conversation in 10 years when we're having a retrospective in MoMA or Met or, you know what I mean? And then people are going to go, oh, I mean, I think there was even one in, um, I didn't get to see it, but there was one at LACMA where they did this almost like generative art and computer art back before there was even generative art. So it was like very, very early, early, early computer art. And so if, yeah, it's all part, again, back to your perfect question. It is all part of past, present, and future. Past, present, and future. It's fun to be a small, loud group that I would say is on the right side of future. Maybe, maybe that's hubris, <laughs> but I, I, really, I really do believe it. No, I agree. I think that's such a to the point and it is it is if that makes sense Ayla where can people find your art well they can obviously find it on Twitter but in terms of purchasing and seeing super rare my super rare um, profile which is just my name and then um, open C for my collections and my editions anything you want to leave listeners with relative to yourself your art career, the future of it? I mean, just a wonderful appreciation for those who listen and those who understand. And, and I'm just excited to surf the wave with you all. <laughs> I had to, I'm sorry. <laughs> As we wave goodbye to everyone, Ayla, I, uh, I'm so happy we, we synced back up after a few years. I hope we continue to do it again. I view you as someone who is shape is shaping the future of this and, and someone who will, will be here to see it through. I can't wait to see what forward leaning display hybridization you have in mind. And, uh, and then of course, can't wait to see it effectuated whenever the, whenever the time comes, we're here for it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's been an honor. Thank you for listening and for being part of the future of art. If you liked what you heard, please do subscribe and drop a review on your favorite podcast platform. Onward to the many interviews that await us. The Future of Art is produced by Artifex. Artifex, A-R-T-I-F-E-X, was created to honor today's top digital fine artists in three dimensions. Each artist's one of one work of art becomes a collectible 3D sculpture and centerpiece of an immersive world built in Unreal Engine, the creation tool of Epic Games. Visit at artifacts underscore project on Instagram to experience those sculptures in AR and visit artifacts.art slash unreal to literally step inside the art on your browser.